I couldn't believe that I could actually do it again, but it turns out I did. Um, I recorded this once, spent a half hour on it, and uh, didn't capture my audio. So I'm going to do this one more time. I'm going to spend less than a half hour on it this time. I wanted, I, I, this time I know what I want to talk about with each thing. <laughs> so we're doing chords. Chords are something that I have talked about, uh, not in great length, but I've given the idea without giving the word too much. I've said the word, but it's been in passing. So today we're actually going to define it, we're going to use it, make sense of it within a circle. And uh, I like to keep consistent with this layout here as long as we're doing circles. That way you see the same thing over and over, you get numerous examples using the same endpoints, and you can really get a connection among what everything is. And like I said, you can get a rehash of what things are, circle and diameter. And we're redefining diameter because we're going to use chords. Okay, a circle, once again, is, whoops, is an enclosed shape where the set of all its points are equidistant from the center. So all of these distances right here are the same length, and they are all your radii. Uh, this will be stressed a lot more, again, in this section, uh, just to make sure that you have something there and you, you know for sure that those work as radii, because we're going to be going back to triangles a little bit more and reverting back and knowing what those mean. Okay, I'm going to type the definitions here for chords so that way it's nice and clean and you can write it out as well. A chord is any segment inside a circle um, whose end, well, that works, whose end points are, uh, whose end points lie on the circle. Okay. What that means, first of all, a segment is, is like, a, it's a straight line. A straight line that has endpoints, so like that and that. So the endpoints lie on the circle itself, and as we know, the circle is this actual rim right here. So examples of chords would be like this uh, purple here from A to D. And another example would be like this purple one from C to B. These are both chords within the circle. It's a line segment. Its endpoints are somewhere on the circle. And that's kind of all that you need to know definition-wise. Those aren't the only examples here. I could also do A to B. D to C, B to D, or D to B, or A to C. Now you'll see A to C and you'll notice that, oh, by the way, that's also the diameter of the circle. Um, so while I uh, skip this one for chord right now, I'll go back to it. I want to write something about diameter here. Um, and a diameter happens to be the longest, I did that again, the longest chord that can be made inside a circle. So that diameter right there also happens to be a chord. We said this before, but before I used a segment, I used line segment. And not to say these aren't line segments, remember this is a segment, but uh, specifically within a circle, we want to give the name chord and define it that way. Okay. Um, and I'm going to refer to this right now. I'm going to go down to this problem 10.3, then I'll work back up and make sure that I can fill this in and that in as well as we talk about this stuff. So make sure those things make sense. I'll throw in mathematical examples as I see fit if necessary and, uh, and then we'll go from there. Okay, let me first read this and see if uh, anything pertains to what we need. In problem 10.1, something we did not do, folding the arc several times resulted in a point that seemed to be the center of the circle. So um, that was something like if you take a circle and you fold a paper in half, you're going to form a diameter. You know, you're going to get something that will give you an area where you can cross diameters through, like here, 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 etc. That intersecting point is called, if I did it right, it's called the center. How can we prove, though, that the line bisecting an arc, like this guy right here, if it bisects the arc, will pass through the center? So how, could, so how are we certain that this chord that goes right down the middle actually hits the center? To consider this, first assume that the perpendicular bisector does not pass through the center. So what we're going to say here is called a proof by contradiction. First, we make a statement and we say, this line passes through a center point. And then someone says, how can you prove that to me? And then I'll say, well, I want to give you an example of a time when the center is not in the center, you know, where the center is off from where this bisecting line goes. And we're going to prove that this, uh, that this has to end up being there for this to work. Okay, 
According to our assumption, if the perpendicular bisector does not pass through the center, then the center, C, will be off the line as shown, in, as shown at right. So um, the thing that I'm going to do here is I'm going to pretend that this is still a center. It doesn't matter that it's off. You know, we don't do things drawn to scale anyway, and I draw circles strangely anyway. I want you to pretend like this is the center. Uh, the distance from the center to any endpoint is considered to be the radius. So if both of these lines drawn here were radii, that would mean these are congruent. Okay. So let's make an assumption, not only that C is the center, but that CA is congruent to CB. Okay. And that they are radii. What I'm going to do here is um, I'm going to work on a two-column proof off that assumption. So I'll go and erase this. Um, but instead, I'm going to add an extra point here, and I'm going to call it E. Okay, and I'm going to create a two-column proof. The main reason I'm really doing the two-column proof is so you get some extra practice and you can look at it again. So if you don't remember what they are, we do statements and reasons just like this. I will write up statements and reasons. And basically what you do is most of these send off uh, understanding triangles. You prove triangles are similar or congruent, and off that you can form a lot, a lot, a lot of conclusions. Check this out. We want to first start by listing a statement and a reason behind it. I want to list a given reason behind the statement. Let's see what's marked. We have that, uh, oh, by the way, I want to make triangles out of this thing. Let's go ahead and from E, I want to prove that these two triangles are congruent. If I prove these two triangles are congruent, then I'll prove these sides are congruent, and therefore these couldn't be, et cetera, et cetera. I'll talk about it as I go. But I want to prove these two triangles are congruent. That is triangle um, B, E, D is congruent to triangle AED. Okay, that's what we're going for, and that'll help me draw conclusions based on that. So let's see, we have marked that segment AD is congruent to segment BD, that's given. Okay. Alongside that, we also do have, this isn't really given, but we do have this as a right angle, and because this is a straight line across, this must be a right angle as well, because they're supplementary, both 90 degrees, 90 plus 90 is 180. Two things that are right angles must be congruent, obviously. Uh, if they're both 90, they're both congruent. So that's angle ADC, or E, I'm sorry, not C, is congruent to angle BDE. Also working off this given here. Let's just say that that's given based on that. So we have two angles, two sides. Um, now, I cannot say anything about AE being congruent to BE. I don't know these are radii. I don't know, I don't know that E is a center right now. In fact, C is the center, so E must not be. But even if it was within the middle, I can't make that assumption. I don't know where I put it. But I do know that this is segment DE right here. This is congruent to itself by the reflexive property. So that is one statement that I can make. DE congruent to itself by the reflexive property. Okay, so again, if you're rusty with this stuff, I'm talking you through it. I hope you can remember this stuff. We're going to go over it a lot more again when we do finals review. Um, and finally, uh, now that we have side, angle, side in this triangle, mixed with side, angle, side in this triangle, corresponding parts being congruent in such and such, we have enough information to say that triangle AED is congruent to triangle BED by side angle side, congruency conjecture. And again, all that means is that we have given ourselves enough information, you know, just like a murder thing, whatever. We, we stacked enough evidence to say we for sure know what's going on here. If this side's congruent with that side, angle, angle, side, and side, then for sure that the rest of the triangle must be congruent. And that's the whole point about CPCTC, which is something I want to draw out here. These segments must be congruent to one another. That is, um, AE is congruent to BE. By CPCTC. What that means is corresponding parts of congruent triangles are congruent. Because these triangles are congruent, we proved it right here. Because the triangles are congruent, the rest of the segments and angles within here must have congruent marks. Okay. Now that's an important thing to talk about there. That, that's something really crucial that you're going to have to understand as we go through this. Um, okay, uh, something that I can't really 
I don't know, I can't really discuss through, through two column proof, but let's say we pick another point on this line. It follows the same side angle side concept. This would be this side, this angle, and this side down here by reflexive property, even with these two triangles. Any point or set of points on this line, I can prove those triangles to be congruent, and therefore these points congruent by CPCTC. I'm going to go and erase this part now and just look at C and say why this wouldn't even work anyway. Let's go ahead and draw this triangle again. Okay. Oh, by the way, this is the triangle right here. This triangle and this triangle. Now the problem is, even if these two parts were said to be congruent, or we assumed they were congruent, now we're looking at this angle here and this angle here. Um, this is no longer a right angle right here. This is a little further off, you can tell. The right angle is right here, this one that's drawn up. So when this is not a right angle, right angle, let's say it's 100 degrees. It's probably not, but let's say it is. If this is 100, then this is 80. These angles are no longer congruent. If these angles are congruent and these parts correspond to the triangles, then we don't have congruent triangles. And if we don't have congruent triangles, then we don't have corresponding parts such as AC and BC. These would not be congruent. And if they're not congruent, then they're not radii. So that was the whole point of me saying before, if these were radii, then this would work. However, these can't be radii because these parts can't be congruent if the triangles aren't congruent. I mean, these parts could be congruent, but if the triangles aren't congruent, then, then, you know, then what matter is there by, by making that statement? We can't prove that. We could prove it with the other statement. Therefore, the center must be somewhere on here because these are the ones that have congruent parts. That's what this two-column proof was for. And again, of course, it was obviously for your own practice. So moving back up. Um, and oh, and uh, I'm going to talk about the chord stuff when I move back down. A chord's perpendicular bisector must pass through the circle center. Center must be on that line. So this center C right here is obviously not the center. That was if we placed it there, what could we say about it? It's obviously moot. I'm going to go ahead and relocate it. I'll put that point E again and say this must be the center. And we can make triangles there, blah, blah, blah. Now, these two things, that, which are radii, by the way, remember that. These radii, when they connect to the endpoints of a chord, we have formed an isosceles triangle. If you can see it here, I got this blue triangle. And this is isosceles because these two portions are congruent. So the part that I want to say about chords here, again, is that um, radii, and let's see, I want to type it, actually. I want to say that radii drawn from the center to a chord's endpoints form an isosceles triangle. Isosceles triangle. So what that means, again, looking back down, it says, okay, radii drawn from the center to a chord's endpoints form an isosceles triangle. Here's the center. I draw two radii. Here's the chord, the endpoints. I draw the radii to those endpoints. I've made an isosceles triangle. What importance is there to that? I'm about to show you. Next page, if you flip to the back here. Um, examine the chord WX in, in circle Z at right. If WX equals 8, so this length is 8 here, and the radius of circle Z is 5, how far from the center is the chord? So uh, draw the diagram on your paper show will work. Well, I'll just use this diagram right here. Uh, so here's my circle. And you know that the radius is 5. Now, here's where you get to be creative on your own. You get to say, what can I do with this radius to do something to solve a problem here? And the other question really is, I, I mean, it says, how far from the center is the chord? So that's about distance. So the question is, how does distance relate? Right? Where, what is distance from this to this line here? Where does it meet? Is it here, 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 here? We need to find out. Now, I have mentioned it before. The answer is that your distance is the closest, is the closest possible point that you can make from something to another. So imagine that you're standing, or well, I'm probably not even imagine, as you're watching this, look at a wall. I, I just go ahead and look up from the computer screen and go and look at a wall. Okay. Um, you, can, you may look down at the computer screen again if you like. Here's you standing there. You're like, hey, but this is a top-down view, and here's the wall. So I guess maybe you're laying down. 
Uh, where's the closest distance from you in the wall? You're not going to look way over here. You're going to look straight at it, De uh, head on, a right angle. All right, so the closest distance between any point in line is the perpendicular line that's drawn from it. So if I take this point right here, I want to find that distance right there. You know, maybe I will make it bigger. Let's go ahead and do a circle. Here's my circle. Here's my center. Let's call it Z. Here's my chord. Let's call it XW. All right, I want to find this distance right here. Let's call it D. Here's the right angle. This distance here is 8. That is this distance, not this one. Okay, um, so I need to find this distance here. So now the question is, all right, how do I use the information that I have to help me out here? You, your first thought might be, I have a radius of 5. Because I'm looking for this distance, maybe if I start drawing it down here, I can work with it. Like, oh, this is 5. And then I say, okay, well, that's all good and dandy, but it doesn't really get you anywhere. You have this as 5. You still need to figure out what that is. You're like, I just need to figure out what this is. Well, that does, again, that doesn't help you much. We don't know what this is. There's nothing to help us figure that out. So what we can do, again, is be creative with that radius. Your radius can go in any direction. Here, here, here. It does not matter. So what I would say, there's a drum line right outside this room. If you can hear that. All right, so what I would say is you've got to focus on these endpoints. Just like we talked about before, these radii will be congruent. Let's draw this radius of 5 right here, and let's draw it over here as well, 5 and 5. So now what we have here are isosceles, or what we have is an isosceles triangle. These two segments are congruent in this entire triangle. And in an isosceles triangle, so the importance of the isosceles triangle, really, is that when I drew this altitude, this D, this bisects this thing into two congruent parts. Only isosceles and equilateral triangles do that when you draw an altitude down from it. So once you do that, you know that this previously what was 8, this divides this into 4 and 4. So the reason that helps us is now we can just break this apart. We can just look at one of these. Notice the green here. I'm going to break this apart and just look at one triangle, one of these right triangles. I'll redraw it here where one length is D, the other's 4, the other's 5. And the question is, what's D? Well, D squared plus 4 squared equals 5 squared. I'll save you the math. This is a 3, 4, 5 special triangle. You'll get D equals 3. So your answer to the, previous, to the original question was, how far from this was this? Well, it's 3 units. Uh, so you can go and look at that again. So the important things, again, were, notice, were knowing what distance meant, knowing how to use your radii in here. Um, and I'm going to give you another example here where you have a chord. I'm sorry, where you have two chords, and they don't really give you too much more other than that, and you want to do something with them. So let's say I draw a chord from here to here, and I draw from here to here. They are totally inconspicuous. You know nothing about... You know nothing about anything about it, like it's, you know, you don't know the lengths, you don't know if they pass through the center, you just know that they're chords. Let's call this W, X, Y, Z. Okay. But they intersect at this point, let's call it, well, let's call it L. Excuse me. Um, okay, there's a relationship among these sides. Let's, let's label them A, B, C, D. <clears throat> There's a special relationship that you can use to figure out, like if you don't know what one of these are, but you know what the other three are. There's a, there's a proportion that you can set up. Because the thing is, we can create similar triangles here. Um, and we can prove, or well, we can create triangles, we can prove that the triangles are similar. So go with me here for a second. Let's say I connect WX and YZ, these dotted lines. Now you see two triangles, if, if you look intently enough. Um, I can prove these are similar. You, you know, I'm not going to write out a two-column proof, but here we have vertical angles. And um, I'm going to make I'm going to make you uh, ignore the triangle look for a second, and I'm going to give you two inscribed angles. Look at W Y Z in green, and then observe Z X W in blue. Here's an inscribed angle going from W to x to z. Here are my two endpoints. And the same two endpoints, w, z, go to y as well. These two angles must be congruent. 
That's, the, that's why I did inscribed angles first. I wanted to make sure that the chords made sense when I talked about that. Okay, so if those two are congruent, then that obviously that means that uh, angle X is congruent to angle Y. So while I hide these, because I want to look at the triangles again, I got angle X and angle Y as congruent. So now I've proved that triangle WXO is similar to triangle ZYO because of angle-angle similarity. And remember, this corresponding parts, right? This angle, this angle, they have to be congruent. That's the third angle theorem. These two are congruent. These two are congruent right here. So they're, they're similar now. The importance of them being similar is now we've set up side ratios um, being similar as well. So if you look at these two different triangles, let's say I look at the bigger triangle, if you, if you say this is bigger. This side right here is similar to this side. As in, if I divide them, well, not similar. They have a certain side ratio. If I do A divided by C, that would be the same thing as dividing D and B, making sure that you keep the corresponding parts in mind. So A over C would be equivalent to D over B. A better way of putting that, if you cross multiply, is that AB equals CD. So this is something that you're going to notice. You're going to have intersecting chords here when you do some work. And you're going to, uh, maybe you're going to solve for X. Like, let's say instead of A, you have like 4. Instead of B, you have 2. Instead of C, you have uh, 1. I, I want to make sure I get a good number. And you say, what's D? You know, what is D? Well, D would be, it's 4 times 2 equals 1 times D. Well, therefore, D equals 8. So you kind of figured it out that way. So D must be the length of 8 right there. So that's just the way that those problems are kind of set up. I just wanted to make sure that you get that proportion and you see why it exists. So it's, you draw two chords, they intersect. This portion of the chord times this portion of the chord is equal, always equal to this portion of the chord times this portion of that chord. Okay. The other kind of problem that you'll run into, and uh, I'd love to do a two-column proof with it, actually, so I'm actually going to erase this. This is what's going to make it take so long for the lecture, which is why it's probably going to run over a half hour. Um, is I want to make, like, let's say you have chords here and here, and the only thing that you know, because this, this is actually equivalent to a homework problem that you have, kind of looks like a baseball. Um, they want you to prove, say, that, like, they give you that these two arc measures are congruent, this one and this one. And they say, okay, prove that these two guys are congruent. Okay. The stuff that you have to work with, really, with these problems, and I, you've seen it from this problem to this problem, and even back to this problem over here again, is that they all involve triangles. All right? Chords are not just the special thing that you can use a ruler with or whatever. They all involve triangles. So you really have to work hard at making sure you work with triangles. The, the really good thing about chords, and, or well, I mean, all right, these chords in this case, is you can draw a lot of radii here. You can work things out in your favor. So if I have radii drawn here and radii drawn here, the thing that I can take home immediately, and by the way, we don't know these are congruent. That's what we have to prove. The thing that I can immediately take home drawing these radii is that these are all congruent to each other. Not only that one's congruent to the other, they're all congruent to each other. You have isosceles triangles if you need to work with those. Okay. Now here we don't necessarily have vertical angles. These aren't straight lines being drawn through. But what I do have is that this arc is congruent to this arc. Therefore, this central angle is congruent to this central angle. Because remember, if this arc is like, oh, 80 degrees, then the central angle is 80 degrees. Same with this one. If this one's 80 degrees because it's congruent, th congruent, this one also must be 80 degrees. So 80 degrees are equal. So these two central angles, therefore, are congruent as you do this problem. So if those two are congruent, now we have, basically, I'm not going to write the two-column proof, but we have this triangle congruent to this triangle by side, angle, side, side, angle, side. So if you have side angle side congruency conjecture here, now you know that this segment is congruent to this segment because of CPCTC. Once you prove the triangles are congruent, then the corresponding parts also must be congruent. So again, if you look at this problem and you just say, well, I don't know what to do because all I have is this, 
right? I, I'm not going to be able to prove these two things are congruent. You start working other things out, right? All this stuff ends up working with it in your favor. It's important to be creative with this. Use radii and draw triangles, and you'll be well on your way as you do this work. Okay, so not significantly less than a half hour in any sort of way, but you know what? I, I, I had to redo it. <laughs> the first one didn't have any audio, so hopefully this stuff made sense as we went along. Uh, you'll have homework assignments involving chords, uh, intersections and stuff, working out proportions, using radii, inscribed angles. All of it should work in your favor. Good luck.